Joe Hodge is with us, Technical Innovations Product Manager from APH. Been on several of our Code Jumper webinars. And Betsy Ann Huggins is going to be presenting today. That's why you're not hearing her speaking now. Uh, she's our engagement and training specialist. She's going to be doing a lot of presenting on journals and such today. So we appreciate her stepping out and being able to present couple challenges for you. Do any of these things sound familiar, things you may have to be dealing with? There may be students that, that need assistance keeping track of their schoolwork. We know sometimes that can be a challenge for everybody. The language of coding can present a learning curve to students. Some of it can be new and different, and you have to get used to it. Code Jumper does not have the ability to record your code so that you can keep it and save it. So what do we do? How do we keep the things we've created on Code Jumper? We'll talk about that in a little bit. And finally, our learning objectives. We're going to list the steps to pair the Code Jumper hub with a Windows computer. We'll explore four examples of computer science journaling. Summarize content to be included in a student's computer science journal and identify three benefits of journaling for elementary school and computer students. All right. And with that, let's turn this thing over to Joe to get us started. All right. So we have what is CodeJumper? So CodeJumper is, uh, sorry, uh, is a physical programming language designed by Microsoft and then developed by APH. It's designed to teach basic concept computer coding to students ages 7 to 11. Now, when I say students 7 to 11, uh, that's the recommended ages. But what we found out is it kind of works with anyone, coding clubs, et cetera. We're, we're, we'll get talking about that on the next slide here. Um, so go ahead and go to the next slide, uh, Betia. So how does Code Jumper work? So it's similar to block steps to, uh, <laughs> it's just similar to block style coding, but tangible. Uh, Code, Jump, uh, Code Jumper teaches concepts with a physical pods and audio feedback. Uh, so we have things such as songs, stories, theme sounds, um, and then custom sound sets. You can actually add your own things. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, Bissian. And then where is Code Jumper used? So this is kind of what I was alluding to just a minute ago. So what we found in just watching uh, folks, we have it as individual uh, use. So kids can take a kit home and use it themselves uh, for individual instruction. Uh, that, include, that also can include the classroom uh, or home. And then we have group instruction. Uh, classroom camps. Uh, one exciting thing I got to do last summer, well, two summers ago, I've lost a year with COVID, <laughs> but two summers ago was I got to sit and watch uh, students come in and play with that during a school for the blind camp in Kentucky. And just, you know, we had kids that were five all the way up to 12. And the five-year-olds didn't get a lot of the, the programming language or the concepts down, but what they liked was to turn the dial and hear a noise the older kids started learning a little bit about if this and that, you know, looping, et cetera. Uh, we also see this in after-school programs such as coding clubs. And then we recommend one kit for every three to four students when used in group activities. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, let's look at the Code Jumper kit. So I think we're gonna slide over to Sully to share the screen here. We're gonna look at the app uh, first. Can you guys see the app? I just want to make sure before I. Yeah, Joe, I've got a screenshot of the app up. So okay. we'll go there. Correct. So if you want to describe that, and then we'll move into just a quick overview of the pods for the 25% yep. who have been with us before. That's great. All right. So on the screen here, we have the Code Jumper app. This is the Windows app. We also are on Chromebooks and Android, which is exciting. Uh, so it does look a little different on on the Android or Chromebooks just due to physical screen sizes and just the way the operating system works. Um, but I'm gonna explain sort of the main layout here. So we have a Bluetooth icon. That's gonna tell you if your Bluetooth is connected. That's important. Uh, it's gonna tell you if the hub is, is on or off. Then we have a musical gear that's for adding custom sounds. There's a lowercase i for about. 
There's a right arrow to play the program. There's a megaphone to read the code aloud. And there's a square to stop the program. Then at the bottom, you have your four threads. So this, is, this would be where your sound sets are going to be located. Um, and that's it for as far as the, the app goes. If we're going to go on to the, the kit here. OK. All right. Awesome. So uh, we're going to describe. So I need to toggle over to my camera. We're going to see and Jim's poker table. Yep. <laughs> Sullivan, Sullivan basement here. And you're going to start with uh, the hub. The hub? OK. Yep. So the hub is the brains of Coach Jumper. So this is a speaker, and it has a volume dial. And it has the four ports, 3.5 inch ports uh, for threads. And it has uh, two buttons on the top. So it has a play pause and it has a stop button. If you hit both of those at the same time, that will read the code that you have on your screen. All right, going on to the, um, to the different parts in the kit. So we have play pods, we get eight of them. Uh, this is a pod that has a wire with 3.5 jack that plugs into the hub. And then it has a 3.5 port that you can kind of extend your thread out. And it has two dials. We have a donut shaped flat dial. That's called the sound dial. That changes the sounds in a sound set. Then the taller dial is the duration dial. Uh, so moving on, we have a pause pod. We get three of these. These actually create a pause or a, you know, kind of a, just a stop in the middle of a, of a thread um, or a sequence of code. So you can, you can pause for one half beat, a beat, two beats, et cetera. We have loop, there it is, the pod that we're here for today, <laughs> the loop pod. It's uh, got two dials and two, or oh, sorry, one dial and uh, two chords on it. Um, and one thing I didn't mention when describing these different pieces here, uh, you can't see it because we're all virtual. You can't really feel it. I guess you folks who can see, can see this, but for the blind or visually impaired student, um, they all feel different and they all are very distinguishable by touch. Um, not only that, but by color for those who have, um, who can see. So, um, so the loop pod basically will repeat a, a sequence for a set of numbers. Uh, so we have a snick going on. We have a selection pod. This is, you get two of these. These are green. Um, this is your if then, then this pod. Uh, and then we have a merge pod. This is green. It's got no dials and just two wires and two ports. And then we get to the fun part. Uh, we get the, the plugs. So we have eight constants. And these plugs have all the plugs that come in the kit have raised emblems on them. So you can tell them apart. So for the constants, they number from one to eight. So you actually feel dots on them uh, to tell which one is which. Random is purple with a raised letter R. That's going to play a random uh, sound set or a random value uh, between one and eight, actually, if the sound set. Uh, Infinity, this is the folks that we get for the interns, their favorite plug. Uh, they will just set a code and keep playing it forever, which gets rather um, a, a bit annoying depending on the sound. <laughs> uh, counters, we get two of these, a plus and a minus. And we have a variable plug, you get three of these. Um, and then finally, we have the extender cable. So if your code gets a little crazy, uh, you can extend it out a little bit and create a little bit more room. All right. Is that it for the show and tell? That is it. So we're going to go back to the PowerPoint here. All right. Uh, give me one second here. I got off on my stuff here. Sorry, I to catch up. I wasn't advancing my slide when I was going through all that. <laughs> All right.
All right, so the exciting thing about CodeJumper for, we have a lot of TBIs on the call here. So this is exciting because and it can be a little overwhelming to talk about coding if you guys have had no experience with it. But one of the nice things about CodeJumper is it's not just a kit and you know the idea of, of hey, this is gonna teach um, a child who's blind or visually impaired coding. This actually comes with curriculums. This is actually great to use in the classroom with anyone. So um, blind, visually impaired, or sighted can all kind of do this together and learn the concepts of, of coding. So what we have here, we have, uh, this is aligned to the national technology standards. Um, we have different lessons. We have eight primary, 11 advanced, journaling to track students' progress, two assessments, and then a project and a rubric. So this is just really important because it kind of walks you through and we're going to actually kind of do an unplugged lesson and a plugged in lesson a little bit later just to kind of show you and like how this would work in the classroom. So I think this is a really valuable tool to, to use as a TBI. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, Betty. So this is introducing a lesson slide. Um, so we have unplugged activity offline. This would be where you're going to kind of do something uh, offline that is going to teach uh, folks about the concept that you're going to teach. So it may be something like uh, you gather an item and you place it in the line. You uh, maybe have a kid say something. Uh, there's there's different offline activities throughout the different exercises. We have a guided activity where you walk through the concept. We have a exploration activity. This is where a small group or individual works, creating a task and computer programming. Uh, then you have a check for understanding and that's it. And I'm gonna, shoot, I'm gonna show you guys how to connect the hub to your computer. So this is the first step that you're gonna do when you get it out of the box. Uh, so you may have to, I don't know if you wanna actually disconnect yours and then reconnect it or if you just wanna, if I want me to just walk through the steps. Um, so the first thing you would do is you would turn, you would put batteries in it. So it does take double A batteries. That's the first step. Um, and once you put the batteries in, you would turn the dial on. It's going to click, and it kind of feels like an old radio dial if anyone remembers those. Um, so as you turn it on, uh, it's going to be in Bluetooth pairing mode. You would go to your Windows computer. That's I'll show you that today. Android's a little different, but roughly the same. So on Windows, to, the, the easiest way to get to that is to hit the Windows key to go to the search box and type in Bluetooth. And I'm doing this right now, awesome. Joe. Okay. And you, you will see Windows pop up the Bluetooth manager. Okay, so I'm clicking on the Bluetooth manager. And you would then click add Bluetooth. And I'm gonna hover over that right now. This would be this plus sign here, okay. And then once you click add Bluetooth, you choose if it's a Bluetooth device uh, monitor. So it, it's just a speaker. So you just click Bluetooth device, just the one that says Bluetooth. And then it's gonna search. It's gonna uh, pull up code jumper. You'll see code jumper and then the, uh, like a long number. That's the serial number of your device. You will click connect. What will happen, your sound will automatically start coming through the speaker of the hub. So if you're running a screen reader like JAWS or NVDA, don't be alarmed. The sound will just start coming through the hub. Um, ultimately, it's a Bluetooth speaker. Uh, and then when you open up CodeJumper, that Bluetooth icon I was talking about earlier will be flashing and showing that you're connected and you will be ready to enjoy CodeJumper. So if I'm connected now and I just make my way over to the CodeJumper app and I m m enlarge that, uh, the Bluetooth uh, uh, on the on the app, does that tell us anything? Uh, with Jaws, it will say Bluetooth connected. I don't know as far as like a sighted person if that if there's like a color it makes or, or changes. Um, Let's talk. We'll toggle back over here to the camera, and in the camera, and I'm you're not able to see this, so the joys of uh, working remotely and not having quite enough light. But <laughs> right here in the center, for you who are light dependent, you'll see that that will turn blue. All right, so, so that would tell you that you would be connected. And one final thing before we move on to Betsy Ann is this does work with screen readers. So on Windows, for example, it works with JAWS, NVDA, and Narrator. So you can use all three. And then with uh, Chrome, it works with Chromebox. 
And then Android, it works with TalkBack. Okay. And so, so Joe, if I'm, if I'm a teacher in say, I don't know, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and uh, I'm having a difficult time getting this connected, can I reach out to APH for some technical support? Definitely, yes. And one and, thing, one other thing to mention about uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the, the app, the Code Jumper app is available on the Windows Store for free and also on the Google Play Store as well for free. And we can just add, and again, I sort of seeing a window into my clutter, but if I go to codejumper.com and I come down here to tutorials and videos, if I click on this, um, there is specifically a video on the Code Jumper app, uh, and, or excuse me, uh, on the Code Jumper website uh, that will uh, walk you through how to go about connecting the hub. So uh, there are videos there on really all of the pods as well as the app itself. So for a little additional support, you can use this as a reference along with the user guide. Right. Exactly. Awesome. So now we're going to jump into the concept of computer journaling. Uh, so hi, everyone. This is Betsy Ann. I'm the engagement and training specialist at APH. And today we're really looking at lesson six loop. There it is. We've all gotten uh, really jammed up by two live crew and the new commercial they do where they're making ice cream. And that uh, is kind of the spirit of the, the lesson we're doing today. Loop, there it is, and repetition is key to learning. So we're gonna be talking about computer science journaling. For those of you who've taken a look at the lesson plans, you'll notice there's a concept called a computer science journal, but there's not a ton of information on how to get started with your computer science journal. So today we're gonna be using examples from lesson six. You can find lesson six. I've dropped um, the handouts link in the chat, it's available there, and it's also available on codejumper.com under the resources tab. You can find all of the lessons there if you'd like to follow along with us today. So first off, let's talk about what is a computer science journal. Uh, when I first heard of the concept of computer science journal, the first thing that came to my mind was my, my science journal that I kept when I was in elementary, middle, high school, as I was exploring uh, different science concepts in biology, chemistry, physics. Um, and it sounded a little overwhelming because there's a real pattern to how a science journal works. You're looking at the scientific method, you're introducing some evidence, your hypothesis, and it could sound really overwhelming. So we talked with Robin Lowell, who works at I2E and has been really uh, integral to the Code Jumper lesson plans. And we talked to her about what is the idea behind the computer science journal. And she gave us some really incredible advice that a computer science journal can be what your student needs for a variety, to solve a variety of needs within your computer science lessons. So first and foremost, a computer science journal is a place for students to record their learning. Um, a science journal can be used to write down what students are working on, what lessons they're completing, and what they're learning as they're moving through the steps of Code Jumper. The journal can also take the format of any device that works best for a student. So today we're gonna do some role playing um, and I'm gonna have my students in the class, which are Joe, Jim, and Paul. They're gonna be using uh, the format that works best for them. We've seen computer science journals take the form of traditional paper journals. Uh, we've seen students who use a document on their computer, whether or not that's a Word document, a Google Doc, or whatever uh, text file works best for that student. You can create an audio science journal where a student might speak into a recording device to record their progress and maybe even take audio files and record what their code jumper is doing. And video files, um, for those, those of you who have heard the inspirational story of Shelly Mack and her student, they used video files to record uh, different points of progress in computer journaling for her student. It could even be pictures, whether those are taken with the camera or hand drawn by a student. So a journal can take really any form and we'll look at a few today. 
So I love the idea that that computer journal can be differentiated based on student need. And finally, the computer science journal is not the same thing as a science journal. It's more free form and it's allowing the student to take the notes that are going to best serve them in the future. So let's look at the next slide, please. So why journal? First and foremost, students need a place to plan and record their code. Um, something that we know about CodeJumper is it doesn't record code. So once a student has successfully completed an activity, they can't just go back and tell CodeJumper to remember the code that they've already created. So that students are gonna need a place to not only plan their code, to think through the steps of coding, but to also record their successful code. Journaling can also allow students to process their thoughts around computing. Uh, we know that vocabulary for coding can be really difficult for some students, uh, especially if it's not notated in their natural language. So journaling is going to allow students to process their thoughts, keep track of the vocabulary that they learned, and think about the communication around computing that's such a vital part of CodeJumper. Journaling also creates opportunities for teachers to check in on student work in um, a really safe way so that students can provide feedback to the teacher and the teacher can provide feedback to the student. And finally, today we're going to be looking at how STEAM opportunities and activities can be introduced through CodeJumper. Let's go to the next slide. So today we're going to be looking at lesson six, as I said, and we're going to discuss four options for journaling. We're going to start with vocabulary and the unplugged activities. Next, we're going to talk through planning your code in your journal and recording your code. So what code you've, co you've completed through CodeJumper. And finally, today we're going to discuss some STEAM activities for computer science journaling. All right, so let's go to the next slide. And this is when we get to, to just check in real quick with you before we begin our unplugged activity. So Paul, if you could please launch the next poll question. We're gonna check in so far to make sure. Uh, okay, there we go. Oh, all the right. question it is up. So true or false, a computer science journal is structured just like a science journal. So while you're taking that poll, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop those in the chat. But for now, let's use this as an opportunity for our students to put on their student role-playing hat today. And I'm gonna ask that my, my three students in class, which are Joe, Jim, and Paul, they are going to get out their computer science journal. So for each student, they're gonna be using a, a different means to journal. Jim's using a paper journal today. Paul's uh, putting his thoughts into a document on his computer and Joe is using a braille note taker. So we've got three different ways to journal that we're gonna be exploring today. No questions have come in the chat. So Paul, how are we doing on the poll? Literally 50%. Very good. Excellent. So take just one more moment to answer that poll question, to check in on where we are before we jump into our unplugged activity. And please feel free during this unplugged activity, we're going to be brainstorming. So use the chat to share any ideas. And absolutely, just like Mary did, you can drop your response to the poll in the chat if for any reason you're having trouble. Still staying it at half. I guess we can let's go, go ahead and share the, the results. The results. Uh, a computer science journal is exactly like a science journal. Sixty-four percent said false. Thirty-six percent said true. So Betsy, and what's the correct answer? That is false. A computer science journal is not structured exactly like a science journal. For, so for those of you who can reflect back on the last science classes you took, science journals are very formulaic. They have very specific um, ideas that we're going to put into our journals. We're following the scientific method all the way from ideation through hypothesis, through our examination into our final thoughts. Uh, and computer science journals can be structured in a much more personal way for students and teachers are uh, able to move beyond really 
uh, formalized structures as they introduce the computer science journal. Computer science journaling can be introduced by any teacher. You don't need to have that background or understanding of scientific method or science journaling to get started with your computer science journal. So we're going to start with our first um, unplugged activity. And we're going to look at how a computer science journal can be used during this first part of the lesson plan. So we can go to the next slide. All right, so for the unplugged activity in uh, lesson six, I'm gonna call my class first to order. So I've got three students in the class and I'm gonna ask all of them uh, to share either present or here when I call their name. I'm gonna take roll. So Joe, are you here? Not here. Jim? Yo. And Paul? What, you talking to me? <laughs> it's like it's like it's like the sweat hogs from Welcome Back Carter. I mean, I ask everybody to put on their middle school hat today. And so I've got I've got some really great students in class, but I've also got some real challenging kiddos. <laughs> um, so thanks, everyone. We just called roll. Roll is something that teachers typically do at the top of class to see who is there. And it's a it's a process that is repeated. I have my list of students to go through every single student needs to call and say they're either present or here or Paul's version, you're talking to me, hey teach. Um, it's a rep repetitive task that needs to be done for each student in the room. So first thing to get us warmed up for today, the unplugged activity of lesson six is to think about repetitive tasks. Repetitive tasks are tasks that have to be repeated or done as many times as there are uh, items to deliver or names to call. So let's think class, let's brainstorm what are some repetitive tasks that we can think of in our own lives. I, I mean, I, I, can, I can think of one. This was uh, painting Palooza 2020, 2021, and repetitive tasks for me were changing electrical outlets, doorknobs, and hinges over and over and over again uh, in the Sullivan household. So that's an example of the repetitive tasks that I was doing. Great. So you had to do, you had to change all of those hinges, all of those door uh, knobs, because the task wasn't going to be complete until you had done all of them. Correct. Awesome. Any other examples of repetitive tasks? Give you a simple one. Yeah. You got to eat. You got to eat. You got to do it every day. <laughs> Three put, times put, a day or more. Plus, when you put the plate down in front of you, it's not like you pick the fork up and you eat that bite and then you stop. You have to keep picking that fork up until you've cleaned your plate or you're full. Excellent. So that is another example of a repeated tasks. Joe, I was going to say, example? Yeah, yeah, feed a feed the cat and a dog. <laughs> you don't do that once. It's yeah, not right. like you bring the cat home and you feed the cat once and then you're like, wash my hands of that. I'm done with that activity. No, you got to feed the cat every single day. Now, for my students in class, does that get maybe a little boring? Do sometimes those tasks you're like oh no, I, I wish I didn't have to do this over and over and over again. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So human beings, we tend to get bored. We tend to get either bored or frustrated that we have to repeat a task over and over again. Uh, really good examples of repeated tasks are things like chores, like feeding your cat or uh, changing knobs on doors or hinges after a painting project. They're things that are onerous that we don't want to do. But for computers, repetitive tasks are really easy and simple. They don't get distracted by watching TV. They don't get pulled into other activities. If you ask a computer to repeat an activity, they are more than happy to keep doing a task until you as the computer programmer say that the computer is finished. So I'd like everyone to pull out their computer science journal, whatever that means to them. And I'd like you to write down some of the ideas that you shared in class and some of the ideas that you heard from your peers of repetitive activities. One of the things I was thinking of for repetitive activities was gardening. You have to dig every hole for your seedling, and then you have to go through your row and plant each of your seedlings in a row until you don't have any seedlings left and they're all planted in the ground. 
So take your computer science journal. And for those of you who are tuning in and you've got potentially your computer science journal in front of you, you can add those ideas of repetitive behavior. Um, I would encourage for my teachers in the room to have their students start every computer science journaling moment with their name, their date, and the lesson that they're learning. So for this, we're learning lesson six. So it's important, uh, especially if you might be going out of order with the lessons so that, that students can always go back, check their work. They know when they accomplished the task, what lesson they were looking at. Um, and most importantly, tracking their vocabulary. So I'm, what I'm gonna ask my students to do now is to think about the concept of a loop. So let's go to the next slide. Today we're talking about what is a loop and the definition that we have in CodeJumper is a loop is a way to organize commands in a computer program so they repeat a sequence of instructions a required number of times. So this is a pretty uh, technical definition of a loop and it might be really hard not only to conceptualize but also remember. So one of the things we did in the unplugged activity was we conceptualized what repetition is. We got it into the vocabulary a student might, might know already and some examples from their real life. So hopefully we're making some connections between the student's lived experience and this idea that we see in coding. Repetition, things that happen more than once. Um, I'm gonna ask my students in their journals to write down the definition of a loop in their own words. So we have our formal definition. And I know for me as a student, I would have definitely wanted to write down the formal, absolutely correct definition. But I'm gonna encourage students to also write down the definition in their own words. So we'll take a moment and we'll see if our students can share any example of what the definition of a loop would be using their own natural language. Do any of my students have that in their computer science journals? I am, I am ready to go, Betsy. Excellent. So in, in my own words, the definition would be to do, to play, or to run a set of instructions over and over. And the, the example that I could give would be counting down from 10 to, to zero over, say, two, three, four times, uh, or perhaps just never stopping, just going on forever. Great. So Jim gave me not only a definition, and I could hear Jim's own language, especially when he said things like over and over. He's giving this idea of this repetitive task that has to be completed. And he even gave me an example in his journal. Do any of my other students have a, a definition or an example they'd like to share that they would put down in their journal? I got one. Great. So a loop is a set of instructions that repeats for a set number of times. And an example of this I gave was like, for example, a chorus in a song. Oh, that's great. Yeah, choruses repeat. You have them multiple times during the song and then many songs end with repeating the chorus multiple times in a row to really hammer that final message home. That's a really great example that might connect with something you really enjoy doing. If you're a choir singer, you might think about uh, the repetition of a chorus in the song. All right, so we're gonna check in with our students out there over the internet, and we're gonna introduce our next poll question. So Paul, take it away. All right, so the question is up now, and we want to know, what is the purpose of a loop in a line of code? There's three choices. Is it to mix up the order of a set of variables, to repeat a sequence of instructions, or to stop the code? What's the purpose of a loop? Speaking of feeding the cat. Yeah. <laughs> Got a little kitty in the background who, who is upset that Paul didn't repeat that line of code. <laughs> it's oh, I think it just wants to talk. Yeah. All right. Let's see and where we are with polls. Yep, 54% already, so we're... Getting We're cruising good. in, yeah, getting and feel good. free again to put your response in the chat if 13. that's easier. 
or if you've got um, any comments, questions, or concerns that we can address while we're paused briefly for a moment. All right, Paul, the suspense is killing me. Let's, let's go ahead and reveal the response to the poll. 93% say it's to repeat a sequence of instructions. 7% went with the first one. What's the correct answer, Betsy Ann? It's to repeat a sequence of instructions. To loop means to do something the same way over and over and over again. So thanks everybody for taking that poll. We can tell that even identifying that a loop is to repeat a set of instructions, that's an easier thing to remember than that longer technical definition that we received. So being able to put these ideas in your own natural language is really important. So let's talk about how we used a computer science journal in this unplugged activity. So number one, we're keeping track of vocabulary that we're learning during our coding sessions in our journals. That not only keeps a written glossary of the language that we're acquiring as coders, but we're also encouraging students to record vocabulary in their natural language. Um, this is a really big concept even in coding with adult practitioners. Uh, one of the things that I found while researching for this webinar was this quote from Technocode. When natural language is used to express the actions uh, that are to be translated into coding language, understanding and retention is enhanced. So this idea that if we can use our own language, our own experience to process the very technical definitions around coding, it's going to help keep them in our memory, keep them in our experiences. So if a student forgets that formal definition of a loop, we can remind them about repetitive tasks. We can use those examples that we brainstormed, setting the table, folding your laundry and putting it away, uh, mowing the yard and having to go back and forth across the yard until the, the lawn is completed. The journals we also use to track our communication around computing. Uh, Code Jumper, it can be used one-on-one -on -one with a student, but the, the uh, lessons are set up for a classroom and for a classroom especially to communicate around computing and to talk out their code together. So we're going to get an example of this in our guided activity. So each lesson starts off with an unplugged activity. We're not touching our code jumpers yet. We're talking about coding using our natural language and our lived experience. And now we're gonna get into a guided activity where the teacher is going to be leading students through a coding activity, um, either as individuals or as a class. So class, our task today with our code jumper is we need to brainstorm how the code jumper can be used to play this sequence of numbers. We wanna play the numbers one, two, three, and four in that sequential order, and we wanna do it three times. So that's gonna end up with the code jumper saying one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's the code we want to write. So if we were in person, I might have my students around their code jumper. They would see that the code jumper comes with a hub and it comes with eight play pods. So far in lessons one through five, we've been really focusing on the hub and the play pods. So those are tools that the students are really familiar with. They're really accustomed to using their hub and their play pods. So I'm gonna ask my students right now, Jim has the, the code jumper in front of him, but my other two students don't. So we're gonna discuss this idea of how could we use just the play pods to repeat this code. We only have eight, right? We only have eight play pods in a kit. So how and do you we're think supposed we're to gonna have, have we're, not, we're gonna have a problem because you want it to say 12 things. Absolutely. Well, I, I know you have a spare code jumper. We could always just steal some play pods. Absolutely. So how would, if we were just going to use play pods, how would we write this code? You would just, from the hub, you would start the first play pod with one, second play pod with two, third play pod with three, fourth play pod with four, keep, keep adding, you know, till you, do, till you go around three times, basically. So you'd have 12 play pods altogether. 
Great. So on the screen, we can see that Jim, who is our, our student who's got the code jumper in front of him, he's got the hub and he's got four play pods that he's linked in one long thread. That's a concept that we discussed during lesson four. Nice threads, which was the title of that lesson plan. We've we've linked four play pods together uh, in a thread. And so, Joe, what you're saying is first, we would have to come to uh, the correct sound set. Correct. Yeah, th so, that's the first thing, yeah. Great. So, Jim, what thread are we using for this code? Are we using thread? It looks like thread one, correct? All right. And so he's pulled up the number sound sets so on the screen right now. We've got on one side our hub with our four play pods. And on the right hand side of the screen, we have the Code Jumper app. We're using thread one, and Jim has selected the numbers sound set. So within the numbers sound set is a recording of a voice saying numbers. So we're going to use first that sound selection dial. That's that flat donut shaped <laughs> dial to select the sound that we're playing. All right. Five, four, three, two. Great. So our first play pod is playing the sound one and our second play pod is playing the sound two. Jim, can you press play on the hub and we can just hear the code as it is right now and that'll help us troubleshoot how we can get it to play one, two, three, and four. One, two, eight, seven. All right, all right. We've got an issue, right? We have an issue. Yes. We have an issue. So let's go to play pod number three and let's get it instead of playing eight, let's get it to play three. So how are we gonna do that students? Well, we're gonna trace the code, right? So we have the first play pod playing one and the second play pod playing two. We come to the third play pod, um, which is playing eight. And so uh, Joe told us earlier that the donut shaped uh, dial is the one that changes the sound in the sound set. So we're gonna turn that from eight and we'll get that to go to three. Seven, six, five, four, three. We'll continue to trace the code going over to the fourth play pod and we'll turn the donut shaped dial to get it seven to go to four. Eight, one, two, three, four. And four. We'll change the, the rate at which it's speaking from one and a half times speed to one time speed. Great, so let's press play and let's hear that code again. One, two, three, four. Awesome. So our instruction was to get this set of code, one, two, three, and four, the sequence of these four sounds to play three times. So did we accomplish our task? No. No, we haven't done it yet, mostly because we just don't have enough play pods. So we could, in our computer science journal, let's write down our idea for how we're going to solve this problem. So to plan our code, we're going to need another device. So Joe, we're going to leave our, we're going to take our student's hat off and I'm going to ask you to put your presenter hat back on again. And let's talk about the loop pod. That's the device that we're introducing in lesson six, the loop pod. What is a loop? So a loop is a way to organize commands in a computer program. So they repeat a sequence of instruction a required number of times. So this is where we'd want to use the loop pod that we showed a little earlier with the two wires and the dial and the two ports on it to plug into the hub and then run the play pods off of that. Great. And Jim, can you pull that loop pod out? And let's talk about what the loop pod looks like. We talked about uh, all of the pods in the beginning oh. introduction of our webinar today, but let's talk again about the loop pod. So Joe, can you describe the loop pod to us again? Yes. Uh, so the loop pod, I'm a little colorblind. I believe it's, it's pale green? yellow. Pale yellow. Okay. All right. Uh, so it has um, a dial on it. So it has a turnstile dial and it has two ports and it has two cables. One is longer than the other. Uh, and 
it would plug into, you're probably going to plug that into the hub. I, I don't want to give too much away because I, I think we're going to, we're going to experiment with that here in a second. Um, but this, this pod, as you turn the dial on it, is going to, you can dictate on with the loop pod how many times that's going to play the sequence of code. So you can usually, you know, choose one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, for example, and that's going to repeat that set of commands over and over again until it hits the end of that loop. And then it will continue on your sequence throughout the code. Awesome. So let's, Jim, just for uh, experiment sake, can you unplug the thread of four play Three. and plug the loop into the hub on thread one? Awesome. So Jim has just plugged in the loop pod with the long cable. And on the app side, we see loop and end loop. So this is a important distinction for to point out for students. So a loop, we're going to put code within a loop. And that's going to be really clear, especially as we start coding. You're going to see how a loop uh, will once the computer code gets to a loop, it's going to run a code of thread and it will repeat it as many times as we ask. And when that loop is done, it can continue with its code. Bessie, can I, uh, I'm going to say something here, just, yeah. uh, just not my student hat, but my <laughs> grown up hat. Of uh, course. So this is really cool. The first time I ever got to play with Code Jumper, uh, I had some programming, programming experience with the you know, developing some computer games and such. And I, so I had learned about coding early on in probably the, the early 90s, I guess, when I was a student. And, you know, I never really got into it because sometimes the con I, I knew the concepts, but I didn't really visualize the concepts. And when I got my hands on Code Jumper for the first time, it was really neat because you could feel a loop. So when, when Jim starts putting this together with the play pods, you can feel where the loop starts, where the loop ends and where it continues. And, and so it's a, you know, people might think that's a minor thing, but as a, as a blind person, when you're, when you're developing code later in life, you're going to go back and remember that's what, a, that's what the loop feels like or what it looks like in your head. It's amazing to me as with tactile graphics and different things, as life goes on, I can go back and, and picture those things I've felt when I'm doing a project. So um that's that's one nice thing about code jumper is you can visualize the concepts as well. Absolutely. That's such a benefit of code jumper is being able to feel the representation of what the code looks like physically and then apply that to your knowledge of how the code is going to end up looking on the computer. And so I'll, I'm gonna Betsy oh, and yep. I'll I'll add to what Joe is talking about and just say that Right now, uh, Microsoft has been working with uh, some PhD students in Cambridge, and uh, that's in the UK. And they are actually just beginning to, uh, they're not, they haven't published anything yet, but they've really been looking specifically at uh, using a physical programming language like CodeJumper in introducing coding to students. And the preliminary results, although the, the number of students that they've studied is quite small, but the preliminary results are a positive, that the physical programming language, the actual ability to be able to touch, to, to take what Joe just sort of described to everybody, that that, that only you know, applies to, to a Joe, uh, but a Paul and a Jim and a Betsy and, and a Billy and, and, and all students, uh, regardless of their abilities. And so I think what we're going to probably see in the not too far off future would be the results of those studies beginning to be published. And then Microsoft uh, looking at doing a little bit more with that. I know we are specifically working with the British Computer Society in getting them going over in the UK and we would love to do something here in the United States as well. Uh, and again, that emphasis, that language that we use, that physical programming language is, is sort of the key there. So, uh, so that's, that's that. Excellent. So we'll put our student hats back on and let's go to our computer science journals 
and now that we know what a loop is, we've defined what a loop is, not only in terms of computer programming, but in our own lives, let's turn back to our computer science journals and let's prep our code. We thought about the using just play pods to write this code and we realized we just don't have enough. We don't have enough play pods to write this code. And even if we did, there's a more efficient way to write this code. So let's go to our computer science journals. We'll take out whatever instruments we need and we can write out that code. So students, how do you think we should write this code to play the sequence one, two, three, and four, three times? So, oh, we're writing in a journal, sorry. Oh, we can share that out loud. <laughs> it's kind of hard to, to replicate writing in your journal for an active audience during a webinar. So let's, we can share our ideas out loud. Yeah, so, and I specifically am a, more, more of a visual learner. The English language has been a challenge for me for all 50 some years of my life. And so I probably prefer to draw it out. Excellent. I mean, I, the, the idea of a loop uh, makes sense to me. So I'm going to, I'm going to use some numbers and I'm going to use a drawing to sort of identify that we would want to use, use that, uh, that loop pod to uh, repeat the uh, the numbers uh, uh, three times, and that we would I would f physically draw out the the four uh, play pods to go along with the loop pod. Absolutely, and for students who might not be uh, fantastic visual artists, you could take pictures, you could take video. We know that there's some trial and error in working with a, a code jumper. The best way to learn with a code jumper is to get it out, get your hands on it and try things until they work. So we're gonna be repeating that process with Jim. Jim's gonna be our hands in this uh, uh, example. And he's gonna try and <laughs> thank you for hand modeling for us, Vanna White. So we're gonna give him some instructions on how we're gonna uh, program this code using the physical coding language of Code Jumper. So Joe and Paul, do you guys have ideas of what we should do first? Maybe turn the dial on the loop pod to three. Great. So we can start with that. We know that we want it to play one, three times. Eight, seven, eight, one, two, three. Perfect. So the loop is going to play three times, but now we need to write the code that's going to go within that loop. One, two, three, and four. So how do you think we need to plug those that thread into the, the loop pod? Are you talking to me or are you talking to Joe? I think both of you, if you, uh, if either of you has a great idea, how do you think we should start? Well, I, I mean, I, I can say that I, I don't know. I, I, I would want to plug the loop into the, the, the hub and then the pods into the loop. That's kind of where I would, that's where I would go. Great. But I, I, yeah. I don't know which cord should go into the, into the hub and which cord should not? Is it the okay. long one? Or I think we should one? start with the taller one. Okay. Yeah, let's right. do that. Ta taller one is in. And so now let's plug in our first play pod that's set to one. And we'll make sure once we plug it in, we can make sure- Two, one. Okay. Excellent. So as Jim turned that donut dial, the play, the hub shared the sound of it. So one at one time speed. That's what we heard. And he looks like he's got the rest of the pods he's plugging in. Great. Hmm. I'm noticing that on the Code Jumper app, Things are a little grayed out. They're not as crisp and clear as we want them to be. So I, that's telling me visually that we've got something that we need to try differently. So for learners who are using just auditory feedback for the code jumper, what they can do is they can run their code and that works on the play pod or the hub pod by pressing stop and play simultaneously. So can you press that for us, Jim? Stop and play simultaneously? Sure. Yes. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. 
So we're getting a burp feedback. And what that burp feedback means is that we've got a bug in our code. We've got a problem. So how do you think students, we need to solve this problem? What's another idea we can try? Maybe we could try the short end of the loop going into the uh, thread one. Awesome, so let's the... try that first. Okay, so we heard a click. We know that it's activating within code jumper and now Jim has turned around the long end of the the code the uh, loop pod the long cord and connected the code and now let's try playing stop and play again to see if that corrected it or if we still got that burp thread one numbers loop three times play one for one times speed play three for one times speed play three for one times speed Play four for one time speed and loop and thread. Excellent. So it didn't burp. So we've got something right, but we, we have an issue. We have it playing one, three, three, and four. So let's trace our code. All right. So I'm going to press these two together. Thread one numbers loop three times. Play one for one times speed. Play three for one times speed. Play three for one times speed. Play four for one times speed. And loop. And thread. So, so my problem as I traced and I touched the second play pod was that it's saying three and it should have been playing two. So I'll just go ahead and adjust that and I'll make that two. Four, three, two. Right. So it looks like you've got the wrong pod there. So now it looks like they're going to play one, three, two, and four. Oh, man. <laughs> oh. Uh, <laughs> You're not tracing your code very well. So I traced it in the wrong direction. Very, very good. So let's do this again. Thread one numbers. Loop three times. Play one for one times speed. Play three for one times speed. Play two for one times speed. Play four for one time speed and loop. All right. So, and thread. Did our trace? Two. We did our. Yep. Three. There we go. Excellent. So, Jim, what I'm going to ask you to do is to can you flip around the hub so it's on the opposite side of the screen? We want to show our audience. Yes. We want to show them how the loop physically looks. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks for doing that. So, let's pretend that we wanted the thread to continue after this uh, loop, where would we plug the next play pod in? So we would pl play the next play pod into the jack in the loop pod. Absolutely. So what you're seeing right now is what Joe was describing earlier. In this line of thread, as we're moving forward, there's a literal loop that hangs off of it. And it has to go through all of the pods, return back to the loop as many times as we've asked it to repeat. And then it's able to continue the code. So that's that example of the physical coding that we're looking and we're, we're being able to see how a loop functions within a line of codes in this very representational way. So let's unplug the last play pod from the loop and okay. let's play our code and see if we've done it correctly. All right. So this time we're just gonna press play on the hub. One, two, three, four, one. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Excellent. We did it, guys. Very good work in this guided activity. We were able to program our code jumper to play the loop of one, two, three, and four three times. So everybody can take out their computer science journals one final time and record the code. And again, that code can be reported in a number of ways. Jim, since he really learns through um, his visual senses, he might draw the actual loops, how the code jumper looked when he programmed it. Paul, who's using a document on his computer, is going to write out the instructions of how he played this particular uh, code. 
And finally, Joe is using his Braille note taker. So, and this is something that I found really interesting as we were exploring the differentiated ways a students can use their their different methodologies for journaling to write their code. Joe, can you just give us an example of how you might record your code using a Braille note taker? Yeah, so um, I'm, I use the Mantis, which is um, something that we have here at APH. Um, and it's a basically a QWERTY keyboard with a Braille display at the bottom. And we have a, a note taker in it. So if, if kids have a Braille note or a Polaris or, or whatever device they're using, they're gonna have some sort of editor on the Braille device. Um, so you would go into the editor and take notes. So for example, um, I explain the loop process. So I'm not, I'm kind of visual like Sully in that, you know, I, I can't draw obviously, but I basically just wrote out like loop connected to hub with four play pods, uh, dial on loop pod set to three. And then I put a continuing thread at the end of loop. Uh, I, I kind of got in a time crunch, but <laughs> I wrote it down <laughs> quickly there. But um, what I would do is um, with the Mantis or other devices out there, you can either save it to an SD card and the teacher could look at it as a text file, or you could even just show the teacher your, your work by handing them the Braille display if, if, if Braille is something that you read. If not, you can also open it up on a computer. So you could just take that SD card, put it in a computer, and open it as a text file. So there's there's lots of ways that you can you can do this. With some note takers, you can email it. So there's there's different ways that you can get the information to your teacher. But this allows me then to kind of come back and look at it. It's it's kind of just you know something like a journal. I think you know these sort of basic note takers work really well because it's just a text file. So ultimately, whatever I write into it is gonna it's gonna be what it is. And um, there doesn't, you know, each journal, a kid can journal however they want. So formatting necessarily isn't the most important thing. The, the important thing is that they're getting the concepts and the learning objectives down. So at least that's my interpretation that I would do uh, as a kid. Uh, so um, that's how I would kind of use this as a, as a Braille device. And what's nice is as we were doing the experiment, I was able to take notes as we were going along. And then I can refer to them later as we're reflecting on the the assignment. That's great. So there's lots of different ways to use your computer science journal. Uh, and we can always use more than one type of journal. Joe might be taking notes, but we could also then take a video of what he's accomplished if we want to be able to record that not only for posterity, but also maybe to share with other students, share with his parents to let people know uh, his progress in coding. So let's go to the next slide and just talk about what we've done in our computer science journal. So first we used our, and we'll go to the next slide. And uh, first we used our, our computer science journal to plan our code. So we record in our computer science journal all of the brainstorming around planning our code. And that can include some false starts. It can include, you know, when we went to our code jumper and we first plugged in the long side of the loop, the long cord instead of the short cord. We can talk about that in our journal and we can record, oh yes, yeah, so it's the short cord that's going to go in first. Then we're going to add all of our play pods and then we can close it with the long cord. So we can record what we've learned in it. Um, we can also think of different ways of writing the same code. For example, we used uh, an idea of just play pods to write our code. We knew that we didn't have enough, but if we did, we could have written this code with 12 play pods. Or we can write it in a more uh, simplified way using a loop, using a loop to play the sequence one, two, three, four, three times. And finally, ask students to detail what they want their code to accomplish. This especially becomes uh, important as we move on to the exploration in the lesson plan. So the lesson plan starts with that unplugged activity without a code jumper. Then we're moving into the code jumper in a guided activity. activity. And finally, the students are kind of released to do their own exploration. So if students are using their code, uh, their computer science journal, they can write down what they want their code to do code jumper to do and whether or not they were successful at accomplishing their goal. So in the next slide, recording your code. So our students today, they used um, 
their computer science journal to keep track of their code because the code jumper can't keep a log of it. It doesn't have an internal memory to keep a log of their code. So they're using their journal to do just that. And we've talked about how tracking can be completed in images or words or even audio recordings. We can use a lot of different ways to record our completed code. Um, so we would repeat this process of planning our code and recording our code during the exploration part of the activity. But now we're gonna jump into what I think is probably the most, to me, exciting thing that we can do with our computer science journal. And that's to take our ideas from STEM to STEAM. So we'll go to the next slide. So first we're gonna write about our coding. And when we asked Robin Lowell again about computer science journaling, she had these three questions that she would start with with her students. What did I do? What did I learn? And how did I feel about the learning process? So first, what did I do? We're tracking the steps of the process from the ideation through some brainstormed ideas. We're tracking our successes. We're tracking those things that we had to go back and fix. What did I learn? This is your reflection process. Um, I'm a strong believer that nothing is learned without reflection. So in this code coding journal, you can think about what I learned. I learned about loops, but I learned about loops in this way. These are the things I tried that weren't successful. These are the things I tried that were successful. And these are my takeaways. And finally, how did I feel about the learning process? This is really bringing in those social emotional learning components to the, the to coding. Uh, we want coding to touch not only on computer science as a field, but also how we're learning during Code Jumper. Are we learning best from group activity? Are we learning best from brainstorming? Are we learning best from, from solo activity? So we're also thinking about ourselves and reflecting on our own learning process. The next slide shows some more advanced option, what I would call a writing frame. Uh, I know a lot of students are really reluctant to put pen to paper or even fingers on a keyboard. They don't want to write down their ideas because they don't know where to start. So this is where we could introduce a writing frame or a prompt to get students writing. Some prompts that um, I think might be really helpful with thinking about how we're using Code Jumper in the classroom are to start with things like, I observed. I saw or felt or heard might be a great way to start uh, a frame for a computer science journal. My experiment or my investigation was, and you could even prompt that by saying my experiment or my investigation was successful or my experiment or investigation was not successful and here's my reasoning behind that. You can write, I found that, or I think this because, and we can scaffold this for our learners. So if we're thinking about uh, elementary school students, we might use writing frames like I saw, or I felt, or I heard, or I found that, or I think. And with more advanced students, we can become more and more technically proficient at writing about coding by using more advanced phrases like, my results are accurate and reliable because that's gonna explain the process that went behind it. So these prompts are really uh, a way to add this A, the A component from STEM to STEAM. So let's pause for a poll question right now. I've been using this, this phrase STEAM and in this next poll question, we're going to see if you know what the A in STEAM stands for. So, Paul, I hand it over to you. Yep, and it is ready. So, what is the A in STEAM? What does it stand for? Is it arithmetic, alpha, arts, or architecture? What does it, the A stand for? And if you've got any questions or comments, you can use this moment to also put those in the chat as we're going into the home stretch of this webinar. Just take a moment and let us know if you know what the A in STEAM stands for. Oh, good, we've got 70% already voted. All right, let's go ahead and reveal the results. So, 69% think it's arts, 12% think architecture, and 24% think it's arithmetic. Betsy, and what's the correct answer? 
Excellent. So the correct answer is arts. So let's go to the next slide and let's talk about the difference between STEM and STEAM. So STEM is an acronym that stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And it's a shorthand of talking about uh, math and science based fields. Uh, there was a real push in the education sector starting in the 2000s to really introduce technology, engineering, science, and mathematic components to a student's education. We know that science, technology, engineering, and math are the future of many careers that students are going to be facing as they move forward in their, their job process. And uh, the introduction of the art to the idea of STEAM has been accepted in the past maybe 10 years. The idea that we don't get to science, technology, engineering, and math without an artistic component. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to ask you to perform a play in your class. I'm not going to ask you to choreograph your coding or even write a sonnet about your coding. But the idea of combining arts with these more technical focused um, educational components is to bring in inquiry and problem based learning methods that are used in the creative process. So in a creative process, whether we're thinking about writing, live performance, music, what have you, we're, we're thinking about problem-based learning. I want to do this and here are the steps that I'm going to work through. And those steps can involve the art. So let's go to the next slide. So there are some inbuilt STEAM activities within the Code Jumper. As you go through the lesson plan, uh, Code Jumper, because it is an audio-based programming, uh, it is an arts, it has arts components already inbuilt. So Code Jumper has different sound schemes that have songs. It has the uh, potential to use instruments and percussion to write songs. So there's already an introduction of the A in STEAM with Code Jumper. You can write poems and short stories to record and play on the Code Jumper. You can combine singing with percussion and instrument to write a song on the Code Jumper. And you can even code programs to create games and teach those games to other students in your class. So the Code Jumper has those creative components already built in. And for many students, create, using their creativity and engaging them through the arts might be a really great way to build interest and build excitement around coding. So let's go to the next slide. But there's also opportunities with the Code Jumper and with our Computer Science Journal for some creative reflection. So as we're reflecting on the learning that's taking place in our coding classroom, we can integrate some more arts-based or creative-based learning. So think about project-based learning through collaboration on skits and performances around coding, uh, especially those unplugged activities in the brainstorming um, about coding is gonna give us some really creative ideas about how coding relates or reflects our own life. So think back to the unplugged activity for this lesson, we brainstormed repetition. So we could create a skit or a performance of students who are doing a repetitive process. That might be another way to um, relate to students what a loop is. We could get up and we could practice um, some type of repetitive activity as a performance. Think about the public speaking skills that can be practiced through presentations on coding, either in teams or solo. Think about creating a walking museum in your classroom with groups of students visiting other students and learning about their code through public speaking. You can draw a representation of your code. That's a really easy way for students to um, process what a code looks like using their own language and understanding is to draw representations of your code. And finally, creative writing assignments can expand on those unplugged activities. So two that I was really thinking of that I would have introduced into my classroom around repetition are number one, to invent a robot that performs a repetitive task and use 
either drawing or storytelling to write about that robot that could complete a task. Or think of an Amelia Bedelia-esque character. Uh, we can all remember Amelia Bedelia in her stories where she is a maid who is very literal. She takes things very literally. And so if we're writing to tell Amelia Bedelia to do something, we're gonna to have to be really clear and really specific. Otherwise things are going to go wrong. So we can use creative writing assignments to further reflect on the more technical aspects of coding. We'll go to the next slide to think about some other benefits of journaling. Number one, it's a way to reflect on your past lessons and celebrate progress. Think about ending your lessons with going back towards the beginning and what were their first ideas about coding? Were they nervous about beginning coding? Were they excited? What did they know going into a lesson and how did they uh, end a lesson? What, what knowledge did they take away with them? Use those journals to reflect on their progress. They can also articulate their ambitions and their goals within coding. I think about the example of Shelly Mack. She's a coding, she was a TVI who was introducing coding to a student who started with one career ambition at the beginning of their lessons. And by the end of the lessons was really considering computer science as a future career track. Computer science journals are also a safe space for students to connect with a teacher on a concern. If you have students who are maybe shy, don't want to raise their hand in class and say, I do not understand this or I'm having trouble with this, they can use their computer science journal to let their teacher know that they might need more help or support, or they can even share what I'd like to learn next. So you can use that computer science journal.